Welcome to your welcome, welcome to your navigating tough emotions as a team um, training where we're bringing everyone together who's been checking out this topic or if this is new to you, no problem. We're trying to figure out what do we do in the moment to support our kids and even before the moments when they get upset and even after the moments they get upset to be able to support them in raising their emotional intelligence, their EQ, for us to be able to get through those times, um, you know, not feeling totally, totally blown out and exhausted from having to, to really help them with those uh, big emotions. And more importantly, building our whole family sort of toolbox and, you know, great strategies of how to, how to be with emotions, how to move through emotions, how to, you know, be able to even have um, some empowerment through our emotional experiences. Uh, my name is Vanessa Callahan. I'm here to, um, you know, bring some great time tested, kid tested, classroom tested, my client, parent client tested um, strategies to today. And the way that um, this, this segment works is it's called Ask Me Anything. And I've collected some great questions um, from folks and we'll be able to share them with you. Um, the questions and also like my best practices, uh, my best suggestions of what you could try next based on your question, based on the ages of your kids. And also on this whole principle of like raising the resilience of the whole family. And that's why I named my company Raising Our Resilience. That's what we're all about. You know, we have dozens of families in a year long program who have been who are working towards us all year long um, and also several folks who are working in intensives with me. And in our group, we have over 500 families who are actively filling their toolboxes with strategies. So that appeals to you and you're not yet in the group. Come over and join us. The link is in the text of this post. Um, if you're already in the group, let's give a shout out to some of our new members who are posing really great questions today. I'm so excited to support you today. Um, and listen for something that, you know, connects to a concern or, um, you know, a, a query that you have, something you're curious about. Also, if you're here live, you can um, go ahead and let me know that you're here. Say hello. Um, or if, even if you're watching the video, say hello. Let me know you're here. And um, be go ahead and participate. Ask your questions or, as well, because I can I can live coach you right here in this broadcast. Okay, if you're here on Zoom, same thing. You can um, participate in the chat. So um, without further ado, let's get started. So a quick review of last time. We've got um, you know this model that we were we were talking about from that comes from Dr. Daniel Siegel's work. Um, he is a, he has a, an MD, but has been incredibly interested in social emotional research and how it connects to the activity of the brain. And more importantly, how we can convey these ideas to our children. And one of the things that I had a chance to show all of you last time, I'll just put up on the screen real quick here in a sec, um, is this model called the brain in the palm of your hand. And I love it because it allows us to um, have a meaningful conversation with young children about what's happening when they get upset, when they have a strong emotion. And so the idea of flipping one's lid is that, you know, you have this, these older parts of your brain in your brain stem, deep, you know, in your, in kind of the palm and wrist area, if that was like where your skull connected to your neck. Then as you travel into the brain, the midbrain has the limbic system, which has all the emotional sort of responses kind of loaded up in there. And that part of our brain is a little bit older. Whereas um, the reptilian brain was about 300 million years old. The kids will love to know that dinosaurs had this part of the brain too, um, if they're di especially if they're dinosaur <laughs> fans. Um, and then this other part is more mammalian. It came around 200 million years ago when our mam mammal ancestors started to develop these kind of more um, distinct emotional experiences. Um, and through their instinct to nurture and care, they might even experience, um, you know, love and fear and, and fear in a different way than just an alarm going off. Um, and then our cortex is developed over time through our ancestors, and also as you know, hu human beings, we've been developing them over, you know, many millions of years. And there's a special part in the front called the prefrontal cortex, which you know, Dr. Daniel Siegel likes to nickname the wise leader, and or this whole part of the brain is sort of the upstairs brain. Well, what happens when a lot of times when we get upset is that we st these parts of our brains, the, the, the prefrontal cortex, the cortex, the um, uh, limbic system and the brainstem, they 
when they're when you're in a calm state, they kind of are integrated and work together. But when you start to get upset and your body prioritizes moving, um, sending, getting your heart rate up, fight or flight, right? Um, you know, processing what's happening emotionally, your limbic system, then we call it like you're, it's almost as if your lid flips. And these parts of your brain are no longer syncing up and firing together. And so it's almost like this part and this part are now disconnected and you flip your lid. And what we need to do oftentimes when we get to that state is we need to put our lids back on. So when we're thinking about putting our lids back on, you know, there are a lot of different ways to do that, which is what this, um, what our next series is gonna be in March is all the different ways to kind of cool down hot emotions. But what you need to know today as we head into our Q and A is that act one, we could call it, is when the lids flip and it's all hot and go, right? Your body is activated to um, maybe take a swift action, which could be a punch, it could be a run, it could be a huh, huh, heaving cry, or it could be a shiver and like a, a kind of a withdrawing and making yourself small and hiding. Um, those are not necessarily voluntary actions. They come from, you know, the connection between the brainstem and the limbic system kind of working together um, after the you know, you've perceived something in the in the field or some or you're thinking about something that has triggered a, a mad, a sad or scared feeling. Also with joy, right? Like you can involuntarily go, woo, and <laughs> not even like think about it first. It just kind of comes through you. Well, when the emotions are especially heightened, it's all hot and go. And it's time to possibly empathize, maybe soothe and calm down, maybe redirect attention, all the things that we'll be talking about all month long in March. Cool and no is when lids are now back on and we have a chance to problem solve, to offer choices, to take action and make plans. Well, one of the things that parents often do is they actually jump the step that, that is needed in act one, the hot and go phase of making sure the lid is back on before offering complex choices, asking the kid, why did you do that? And having them come up with a reason. Um, we can often go too, too far into the upstairs brain when it's not online, right? It's flipped. And then we can often also do the other opposite, which is we soothe, 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 and once the lid's back on, we don't take the time to problem solve with them, to make a plan for next time, to, to you know, have them reflect on what just happened and make sense of it or offer ways of repair. Sometimes we just kind of move on. And that makes sense, right? Folks, we're not gonna be able to address every upset in, in, in this very specific way. However, if you have a child who has what we, I call a fast lid, <laughs> you know, a quick lid just goes whoop, uh, zero to 60 people will say, um, where they're suddenly shrieking, you know, or suddenly throwing things, suddenly saying really mean things, so just tears come, come out so fast. It's really helpful to explain this to kids. And that's what we did over the Emotional Mastery Weekend with my clients and some guests as we learned how to do that and share it with our children. And so I just encourage you to help kids get to know their brains. Um, and so what we'll be doing in, like I said, this in the March series is we'll be talking about specific ways that you can introduce into the family so some strategies to put that lid back on and really soothe, soothe and calm down and how to also read the signs that that's what's needed instead of going into problem solving and trying to, you know, kind of draw answers out of your child or get them to make good choices because literally they're having a hard time with that. Their brain isn't integrated enough. Good news is that over time, as you learn more and more strategies that kind of help you maintain, you know, kind of integrate your, your, your brain, the parts of your brain and or put your lid on and or keep that lid on, um, it, creates new neural pathways or strengthens the ones that are already there so that it becomes easier over time to do things like catch yourself before your lid flips or and or put your lid back on once it has flipped um, and or um, even be able to make a plan for what happens when your lid flips. And I see that we have Carla here. Nice to have you here on Zoom. Carla, say hello if you're listening. I love, love hearing from you all. And Carla was one of the smart parents who came to the Emotional Mastery Weekend as a guest. And it was, Carla, it was so fun to work with you and um, support you during that time. Curious if you have any takeaway you want to share with the group and any follow-up question, um, you know, so that folks can also learn from your, your wise questions. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and if you, I have a few folks here listening on Facebook. It looks like Sarah Kowalski is here, uh, another one of my smart uh, 
folks who has have dedicated time and energy to this topic, always coming back for more, right, Sarah, trying to just fill up your toolbox in every way possible. Uh, we do we do meet, but also having having these trainings is so helpful, I know. Um, so let's get dig right into these uh, questions that have come up over this last month. So one is how do I stay positive and reframe corrections into positive actions? I love this question. This is from Sarah, um, or sorry, from Stephanie, Stephanie Fletcher, um, who I actually used to go to high school with, who now has um, a, a bunch of kids. <laughs> and um, you know, also I think works to support moms with various wellness, uh, wellness uh, goals. But Stephanie, so staying positive and reframing corrections into positive actions. Such a good question. So staying positive is a whole is a whole thing because oftentimes, you know, we can we can be positive, we can misplace our positivity and sort of fake it till we make it, but then and sometimes it helps, but other times it's sort of misplaced. It could even be possibly a little bit like dismissive or even at times oppressive because there are times when anger is justified, right? Or um, expressing sadness or expressing fear or expressing disappointment. It's, it's really justified, really helpful because it kind of activates inspired steps. It can also bring a lot of clarity. Um, it can, um, anger especially can like bring a lot of energy into the body. Sadness can bring a lot of like clarity and like meaning. Um, so sometimes the like negative emotions or the negative sort of corrective things um, are, are incredibly necessary. So staying positive might be look a few different ways. Um, so corrections into positive actions, I would say the first thing is if you can address the child's emotional needs, emotional and or physiological needs as a showing of care while you're also leading them towards more um, positive actions or more constructive, I'll use that word probably more, constructive actions, you're gonna go a lot further and it's gonna feel a lot less like correction, a lot more like support. So Stephanie, I'm curious, like, you know, put in the chat when you hear this later, like in the correct, I mean, in the comments, like an example that maybe that you find especially tricky. Um, but I'm gonna maybe share, share one for that I've seen. So let's say a child is like not cleaning up the bathroom <laughs> after themselves. Um, this is something I, as, as a step parent to a young boy, you know, to a, a, a tween, <laughs> uh, we encountered this. And, um, you know, correction would sound something, a negative correction perhaps would be like, oh, why do you keep forgetting to put the toilet down and wipe the seat, um, right? So that would be maybe a, more of a correction, a more positive or a more constructive reframing. <laughs> um, could sound something like, especially with an older child, which I know you have a few, Stephanie, um, stating an observation, like bringing their attention to the issue, which is more caring <laughs> and um, more considering that maybe they're aware, you know, let's find out. Um, hey, um, did you notice that the toilet seat's up and there's still, um, you know, there's still pee on, on, on around the rim? Did you notice that? <laughs> um, so it's just like, I'm observing it. I'm asking if you're noticing it. Did you see it? You know, and then giving a little space to see what they do next. Oh yeah, so sorry, I forgot to wipe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you please? <laughs> um, or no, and they're like, oh wow, seems like <laughs> seems like we need to take a trip into the bathroom and take a look. And then you do, and they're like, well, that wasn't me. And it's like, oh, how funny. I'm pretty sure you walked out of here last, you know? <laughs> um, well, either way, we help each other clean the toilets in this house. So uh, how about you grab um, the spray and I'll grab some paper towels. Yeah, so like a willingness to do, to do it with them, partly. Um, and then as you're cleaning, saying like, this is part of why we want to clean up, right, hon? Like, what, what, do you think, what do you think could be a good, good kind of way to go forward from here? Um, cause I'm super proud of you for like, like, you know, putting down your ugh feelings. It's, I know it's kind of gross and just getting it done with me. I really appreciate that. Uh, what, what could we do differently next time? <laughs> um, and you see, like it's, I'm alongside, I'm not going you and how could you and all stuff, right? I'm not accusing them of, of doing it wrong or always doing it. I'm not dragging it in. I'm kind of giving them the space to, you know, maybe show up the way we want them, hope for them to show up, maybe a little humor in there, you know, like maybe you're gonna go ew together and make it like, you know, kind of just 
play into that feeling of, of, of a little bit of disgust is happening. It's like, I know it's a gross job, um, but somebody, we got to do it. Someone's got to do it. So we might as well all do it a little and not no no one has to do it all. Um, another thing you could do to reframe a correction into a positive action is um, sometimes you are literally having to correct them very clearly. Like um, it's not okay to hit your sister. Please put your hand, please take your hand off of her. You know, please, please, please step back from her. Um, you know, like, or, hey, not okay, you know, like, like, <laughs> and it may be a finger on the chin, not okay to bite, right? Like, sometimes the corrective action is, the corrected, the correction is really connected to a very important healthy boundary that needs to be held. And maybe that's what's happening. When that's the case, you can still be positive in the sense, like, you can say what it is that you need, you need them to stop doing or, or, or uh, what the limit is, what, what demand you have, right? Like, what your expectation is. And then you can also support them in making a better choice or getting their need met because oftentimes acting out is a form of communication. You could say, it looks like you're trying to let your sister know you don't like that. So let's use our words. You could say, I don't like it when you touch my toy or I don't like it when you grab from me. Um, please, please stop, please stop crowding me. You know, whatever it is that's going on, you can empower them with a constructive message to replace the action. Um, that could be supportive. Another thing is if they're out of control, as we were talking about at the beginning of this training, you can support them to put their lid back on and offer some kind of coping strategy or redirection. Like, um, like let's let's go let's go over here and look at a book for a second. Or how about we how about we put a hand on our heart and our belly and take a breath? Or how about if you're really angry or something, it's like how about we go <laughs> in um, you know, like at, at, at our grizzly bear, you know, like maybe we have a little bear. Um, how about honey, let's go. Let, go, go run some laps and come back when, you, when you're done. You know, um, I had, had a teacher once have a kid who was like having a deep, deep amount of uh, kind of rage at a, lot, a big loss, throw ice cubes into, um, into a fireplace, you know, outdoor fireplace, just chuck them in there and watch them break and just have that satisfaction of letting it out, you know, screaming into a pillow, other, other constructive actions. And the reason those are actually constructive is that it's a release of that energy and that emotion in a way that isn't harmful. And then, and then inviting them back in once their lid is coming back down, yeah. And because you are both being demanding and supportive at the same time, the message is, I'm not gonna let you slide um, and behave in a way that you like, you know, isn't isn't up to your potential. Like I know that you can do better than this, right? And we all make mistakes. We all lose our cool. Let's let's help you get back to where you can make the right choice, yeah. Hopefully that's helpful. Stephanie, the big reason I really love your question is that they, they say that um, a lot of relationship researchers, especially like John Gottman and his whole um, you know, body of research said, came up with a ratio of how many positive to negative interactions does it take to stay in a positive relationship? Um, and it turns out, you can take a guess in the chat if you want, Carla or anybody listening, Sarah, how many times do we need to be positive to every time we're very negative? I know that's like very simplistic, but just kind of, you know, you know, feel into this with me for a relationship to stay positive. Turns out it's four to one. Yeah. And in romantic relationships, it's more like 10 or even 15 to one. 15 to one. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big, it's a big, <laughs> It's a big undertaking, but think about it. Like think about the last time you had a fight with somebody in your life or like had a really, like they said something snappy at you. Were you like, sometimes we can just get over it and we get over it and get over it. But at a certain point you're like, you know what? I need to have like a whole, like a good fight free day to feel like I want to put up with this. <laughs> you know, like, and I also want, maybe want to hear an apology, <laughs> some repair, something, um, some, some uh, acknowledgement of what has happened or um, a desire to do better or something before I'm gonna consider spending more time with you because this is ridiculous or giving you the, the 10 things you want from me, you know, kid. Um, we, need, we need to repair first and we need to have some, like, can we at least have a good evening before we, you know, <laughs> put up, you know, good hour this evening before we put it on your show, you know, that sort of thing. Carla is guessing one to two, only if only, yeah. That's often when we've had a deep reserve in our emotional piggy banks, either as individuals or in the relationship, then you can have an off day where you can kind of keep recovering. But if over over weeks, months, years, I guess to maintain a positive relationship, the research shows four to one. 
yeah, 10 or 15 to one in romantic relationships. So holy moly, <laughs> yeah. Um, so great questions. Uh, Stephanie, would love to hear your thoughts. Um, let's see who's next. We've got, doo -doo -doo. Um, Ko is asking a question. She, you know, Ko wants to know um, how can we help her four-year-old accept results that are less than her expectations? Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, you know, Carla can relate to this one. So your little one doesn't get what they want and doesn't match their expectations and then they throw a fit. Mm -hmm. It's happening all over the place. Yes. So one big antidote is building appreciation practices into your household. It's something I train all my clients on. It's something that I've, I've developed curriculum around for elementary and preschool. And it's more, way beyond just saying thank you. It's way beyond writing a thank you card. Those are great social graces. I'm so glad we have those rituals and those routines and social scripts. But going beyond that to like really tapping into authentic gratitude takes awareness. And what I mean by awareness is like, Practicing noticing the good around you, practicing noticing the kind of acts of others when they go out of their way to do things for us. And the most powerful intervention that I've seen for young kids, um, so we'll start with young kids, so this is like eight, nine and younger, is to write stories about times that they received something good from somebody and they felt grateful. And when you write this, it can be out loud, also, if they're too young to write a story or they can't think of a story, or even if they can, for us to tell stories of times that you've seen people in your child's world going out of their way to do something nice. Um, for an example, it could be like a male person who, um, you know, like something fell and it might have broken and they wrote a note and said, I'm so sorry, I think this might be broken. Let me know, you know, if, if, I, if we could fix this for you. Went out of their way to fix a mistake Maybe that's a kindness. Um, somebody who went out of their way to uh, make your birthday really fun by um, inviting you to play an online game or something, right? And like thought of you and were really, really wanting to give you a fun experience. Um, it could be everyday things, not like I woke up and I care about you, but like, <laughs> like everyday things like, um, you know, making a separate batch of mac and cheese. <laughs> um, and like, let's say grandma's there, she's helping cook. And she makes a separate back of mac, batch of mac and cheese, even though she's not going to eat any, just for your child. We could say, wow, you know, it'll give you an example. Wow, well, you know, did you know that grandma doesn't even eat macaroni and cheese? Yeah, I saw her in the kitchen for one whole hour making and cooking and stirring the pot, putting in the pasta, you know, and she even also bought it for, for us. She went to the store and brought it in. She made it for us and then she, she waited till it cooled and put in the sauce. See, there's a story, kids love stories. And then she put the sauce in and she stirred it up and then she served it on a plate. And I saw her smile when you took your first bite. What is, how does that make you feel to know grandma, you know, really loves you and cares about you so much that she would make a special food for you? Oh, I don't know about you, but it really fills my heart with, with joy and even a feeling of like, I don't know, appreciation, gratitude, like love, you know? Um, can you feel that light you up too? Uh, I wonder what, I wonder what, why she did that. Oh, she must really care about you and love you. And maybe she's even, what kind of person is she? Like, oh, maybe she's a really good person. And what does she have to give up? And this is for a little bit older, like six and older. Because I've had six-year-olds be like, she spent all her money, all of it. Every dollar she has, she spent it all on this pasta. I kind of think I'm like, okay. You know, like close, right? The sentiment is there. Um, but what did she have to give up? Yeah, I saw her give up her time. And even though her feet sometimes get sore from standing up, she stood up for a long time so she could make sure it didn't burn. Um, you know, she could have been doing her her um, painting, you know, hobby, but she didn't. Instead, she made this food for you. That's so nice. And then here's the golden question. How does that make you feel? And what would you like to do about it? <laughs> Bringing in appreciation practices is like an antidote to entitlement. I'll say it again. Appreciation and gratitude practices is like the antidote to, you know, the seeds, of, like kind of the beginning of what we consider entitlement. Little ones don't have enough life experience to know what they're entitled to. They really don't. They, they think they're entitled to what they want. 
because they're maybe they're used to being out of the body as little spirit gods or something right like being able to create reality or whatever but i swear children come in thinking that, that they can like just have the reality that they want and they're learning rules like there isn't an endless supply of cookies <laughs> um you know screen time does need to end you know um we can't just watch screens all day we need to learn things and sleep too um and and you know get outside all the things they're still learning so you know tuning into that um co would be really helpful. I think also helping them with their frustration. And this goes back to the lid flipping. So it's called frustration tolerance. <laughs> so being able to tolerate the feeling of frustration. And when you're tolerating the feeling of frustration, often it's lid managing, right? You're managing an emotion. And so finding ways to acknowledge the frustration. It makes sense you're frustrated that you can't watch more. The show is so interesting. Of course you want to watch another one. I get it. And oh, too bad. It's, you know, the clock says it's eight o'clock. It's time for bed. You know, this is that, this is it. Oh, I know you're disappointed, honey. And, you know, and I think that we could, maybe we could choose to finish our dinner faster tomorrow and we'll get to watch two episodes. Maybe. Yeah. Let's see what you choose at dinner tomorrow and kind of give it back to them a little bit of like, yeah, yeah, and it's like, no, I'm still so mad. It's like, okay, well now our choice is how are we gonna put your, how are we gonna put a lid back on? Or um, look at this and kind of like help them get their mind off of it if they're not able to kind of choose, you know, a way to calm down. And so it, building frustration tolerance over time is something that's really powerful and it does happen. It will, <laughs> there's a light at the end of this tunnel and it's worthwhile. Um, what can slow down kids learning frustration tolerance is if we engage in an argument with their emotions. You, should, you shouldn't be like, um, stop, stop yelling or stop, stop being so upset. Um, you know, uh, you'll get one tomorrow. What's the big deal? You know, kind of like dismissing and putting down or even arguing with how they're feeling. Oftentimes just makes them want to dig in harder so that you, to get you to understand how they're feeling. And that can actually reinforce this negative feeling or this like upset feeling and this frustration because now they're even frustrated. Now they're frustrated that they're not being understood and it can actually make it even harder for them to tolerate frustration because they're not getting kind of a, some, you know, an empathetic ear and some, some confirmation and some strategies of how to shift it. So helping kids through the emotion much better than arguing with the emotion. I'll say it again, helping kids through the emotion much better than arguing with the emotion. Right, Jen? <laughs> I know Jen's going to tune in soon. Um, Jen LH. So Preeti, I hope we've, we've um, you know, we've uh, addressed your questions. Um, I've got you tagged here. You can go back um, through the video and listen, but she wanted to know how do I manage big emotions and meltdowns? Well, I also encourage folks if they haven't yet to go back and listen to what I shared this month. Um, already, uh, or back in, you know, this, this month, meaning February, this previous month, um, I have some links set up, um, you know, I can also throw them in the chat here, of the first two videos that really broke down the science of big emotions, as well as um, gave, give you the sense of like, what, what kind of myths might be getting in the way of you, like your, your perspective that might be getting in the way of you being able to support kids during their big emotions. Because man, when we have a, we have like a, a we get triggered and we just go, Ugh, you know, why are you angry? Anger is not safe. You know, we have a story about it, right, Carla? We talked about in the Emotional Mastery Weekend. Um, it can really get in the way of helping kids manage through it and navigate through it because we're resistant to the, the, to the um, emotion even existing in the moment, right? You're like saying, this shouldn't be here. Let's, let's stop it. Stop it, put it away, you know, make it go away. Now, it doesn't mean that every single time your kid gets upset, you should drop on an, on, on the level and go, oh, honey, I'm so sorry you're sad, you know, because it's also, that's also not always helpful. Um, I'm talking about the times when there are really big upsets and they have lost control, because guess what? That's kind of scary or, and, and or very upsetting for kids when their lid completely flips and they don't know how to put it back on. You've seen it, right? Um, and sometimes you just need to just be present with it, accept it, wait, you know, give, give suggestions of ways to cool down, um, offer them comfort, and then make a plan for next time when the episode is over. I noticed that it really helped you to take some breaths. I noticed that it really helped you to go to your room for a while and do something else. Um, and, you know, we can also do this. We can do some wall push-ups when we're really upset, you know, like push against the wall, or we can count to 10. 
breathing in and then breathing out, you know. So again, more strategies to come. I hope that's helpful, Preeti. There's, I have a whole body of work on this to share with you. So do let me know if you need more um, and we will walk through it together. Um, I've got one from George here. George wants to know about his three and a half year old and Oh, I love this question. It's so it's so cognitive. It's like how we think. Um, he wants to know how do I help my three and a half year old understand when asks. I'm, I'm I'm guessing you mean like requests, right? Asks are serious versus a game. So I've actually come up with code words with kids. Yeah, especially kids who are delightful. Like they have a sense of humor. They they could giggle for hours with you. Like you could play Tickle Monster all day. You could, you know, like they even understand some sarcasm perhaps because they're older, right? Um, and you can just have this like incredibly funny time with them. And and um, but, and that may, can make it really hard when you're trying to be serious with them. They don't want to take you seriously because you've already said a lot of things as a joke and they don't, they're not recognizing which is which. So one easy hack that might work is to come up with a word that means I'm serious. Like it could, it could be like, um, think of like a serious character in a story they know, um, maybe an animal that they would relate to having a serious face, um, you know, and, and it's like your code word for, I mean what I'm saying. The other thing is if they, and this is, this is part of the lid off on the positive side or positive emotion. That's why it's always confusing to me to call this like positive, you know, some emotions negative or positive. It's more like this intensity that they're having around like not having much self-management in that moment. Like they're probably a little giddy, maybe a little hyperactive, maybe a little what we would call kind of loopy where they're not quite like in reality with you. And they're kind of looping away into different ideas and imaginations. They're just like not, reading your body language of this is serious, you know. So there might need to be a transition into listening where they put their lids back on, something calming. One of my favorite things to do when I really want a kid to listen is play some game with them that requires listening. And, and I would even bring in things that they need to guess so that they, they could guess which character you are from like a serious character to a silly character. <laughs> and you'd be like, am I being more like, uh, you know, um, sunshine bear or more like grumpy bear right now and you're like grumpy bear you know or like sunshine bear and like you know but you could play a game with them where they have to tune into you and listen or you could read a story to them that's really helpful because they're going to watch you in your mouth and your face and they're going to look at the pages and they're going to be like a little student in a way of like receiving information from you and then they'll hear you better because sometimes we we have to kind of meet them where they are and help and, and come over to the other side of the silliness. <laughs> like it's not gonna be a snap to it situation. Um, Cause they need a little time when they're a little loopy lit off version of lit off where it's not all connecting to kind of come back to kind of cool knowingness, clarity, some sort of lucidity, like I'm here in reality with you. Um, Carla says she's also having some ask issues when she's happy, right? Like, like the, the the really like joyful things, like jumping on the bed, like you were saying, and it's time to get dressed, right? And um, and I love it. You just tell her you can keep jumping on the bed, but let's put clothes on first. So yeah, it's not necessarily like stop the fun. It's not like a full stop on fun. It's like, how about we, you know, we got to take care of this, and then you get to have that. Isn't that great? <laughs> Right, and I mean, with older kids, sometimes they just get really into their projects or their ideas. Like we've got kids who are now getting super into video editing and Minecrafting and Roblox building. And, um, you know, I'm thinking of all the kids when they're deep in their Lego sets. Sometimes we need to let them know very, very clearly that they're able to come back to the exact same spot they were, whether it's pausing the game, leaving it running, putting the Legos into a separate little tray so it's there for them when they wanna come back. They don't lose their spot in their building. Um, to help them transition from the, the fun part, <laughs> the fun thing to a more serious thing. Um, and sometimes it's about loneliness too, cause like they're having a great time connecting with you. And so they, if there's a way to do the next serious thing in a connected way, kind of like what Carla's talking about in a sense, right? You're not saying go to your room and put your clothes on. And you're like, yeah, we'll, we'll jump on the bed, but let's put your clothes on first. Um, it's sort of like, let's just shift the focus here and come back to it. Um, and, and, or, or, and or like stay connected and having a good time. Um, but oftentimes it's sort of just getting those giggles to shift to like breathing, <laughs> like actual like regular breathing. And, 
okay, yeah, all right, let's take a moment here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I've also seen kids need a little more time to be wacky and zoom, zoom, zoom and get those final laughs and giggles out. And so maybe it's also being a little more flexible about like, okay, we're gonna give a couple minutes for this to kind of wear, like for her to wear herself out <laughs> in the zooming around or whatever it is that needs to happen. A smart client of mine is she's she's a single mom and she was like, you know, she came all the way out here from Texas, my dear friend Allie now, and she um yeah, she's in the immersion program. And she told me I could share the story that her daughter would um always as soon as she got the clothes off for the bath would then play like play chase me around the house instead of getting in the bath and at first like Ali sort of made that wrong and I, I would I would be like what are you doing no like yeah you're funny and this is fun but like I don't I don't want to chase you around the house to get you in the bath honey come on what are you doing like stop that you know and what we realized was like if she built in to the schedule a time for them to play a chase game right before bath time and it just became part of the routine and it was sort of a limit of like i'll chase you three times around the house and then and then it's bath time you know and, and she got her agreement ahead of time like we'll play a chase game but once i say that's once that's twice and when i say that's the third time then we both get into the bath and if you don't listen then then well we'll have to get rid of the chasing game sorry hun and she really responded to that she was like i want to yeah i get to do what i wanted to do and i'll get in my bath and so it was a turning, it was a turning corner kind of moment for them to have a much better evening because what used to happen was they get into a power struggle and then Allie would get all upset, her own lid would flip, and then she'd end up having to be a lot stronger with more consequences. And then, you know, her daughter wasn't happy with that. And then there was a power struggle. And sometimes she never even got in the bath or she'd have to force her into the bath, which is the worst. So um, yeah, a lot of avoidance of that power struggle by building it into the transition. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a really helpful um, example, I think, because of what's possible there. Now, George, um, I'm wondering if there's more, you know, give me a specific scenario. Um, same with uh, with other folks here, Priti, Co, other people who are listening. Give me a scenario. I, I'd be help, happy to address it right here as we're winding down this, this Ask Me Anything. This is your chance to get some live coaching. Throw it in the chat, in the comments. Um, and if you're listening on the um, Raising Our Resilience page, which has the, the hands up over the gold in front of the golden sun as we raise our resilience, um, you're gonna need to hop over in, and join our group. Um, Carla would tell you, other folks would tell you who have been in that space. Sarah, um, Jen, I know who likes to come to these, that it can be a really nice way to just get um, a weekly boost of tips and if it seems to you like you would love to be in this kind of container of membership, or of mentorship, support on a more regular basis, come join the group and even consider one time at some point joining our year-long immersion where a smaller cohort of folks, not 500, more like 20 to 30 <laughs> families travel together for the year. And I know Carla, you were, you got to meet a bunch of the great parents, um, you know, as a guest at our Emotional Mastery Weekend and so did Jen and um, other folks. So um, if that's appealing to you, um, be sure to let me know and I can even share a way that you could uh, we could have a conversation about that. So um, yeah, see you, see you in the group, those of you who are not yet. And uh, let's keep going. So Ty has a question about how do I manage parenting during a pandemic when everyone has been together 24-7, 365 days? Well, I'm gonna turn this over to you first. <laughs> we've got Carla here, we've got Sarah here, I believe, and someone else just joined. What is a way that you manage parenting during a pandemic? I'm serious, like to let, share, let's help tie out here and everyone else who also would like to swap some tips. This is a question that I ask at all my school workshops too, so that parents can have a chance to share their good ideas. We need to crowdsource and help each other. This isn't an easy time, you know? I'll get, I'll help you, I'll help you get started as you're writing yours as well, but please do share your gems, even if you're listening to the recording, okay? Don't hold back. Something small that might seem obvious is actually, could be somebody's like mind blowing moment it happened all weekend long, two weekends ago at the Emotional Mastery Weekend. People's ideas, others were like, wait, I wanna try that too. Um, and uh, what stands out to me is, um, and I said this at the beginning of the pandemic and I'll say it now, if you haven't done it yet, adjust your expectations. If you're used to being an A student, let yourself be a B student. If you're used to being a B student, let yourself be a C student. Um, 
Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, even hired me. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, Carla, the question is, how do I manage parenting during a pandemic when everyone has been together 24 seven and 365 days? So first, lowering your expectations of the, the level, the quality of work that you, your children in all spaces, housework, homework, you know, work, work for, you know, occupations, adjust your expectations of what kind of a performer you're going to be, especially if you tend to hold yourself to really high standards, you need to lower your standards and you need to train others to do that too. So that means you may not show up for every meeting. You might need someone to take notes sometimes. You might have to leave a meeting for five minutes to help your ch child log, deal with some sort of Zoom login and come back and to let people know that that is what's happening and, and advocate for some uh, sense of humanity <laughs> around our pandemic situation, especially for parents. We have to train folks in our world to understand what our needs are because they may, may, may not be able to imagine what they are for us. And this is like where I get kind of, I get pretty passionate about parent advocacy because what I've seen is that in, especially in workspaces where there isn't already an, an employee resource group like DocuSign has one for parents. They recognize that parents have a unique set of needs and it is a unique identity and parents and caregivers, not just biological parents. There are a lot of ways to be a parent and a caregiver, um, but people who have children that they're responsible for in their lives um, are a special group of people yeah, with um, specific needs and wants and wishes and priorities. And if that's not a space that you're in or you don't have that kind of uh, support group in your world, advocate for what you need, knowing that in the end of the day, it will shake out properly. It should, right? Like in the end of the day, we are people raising other people, other human beings as our number one job. Yeah. So advocacy, lowering your own expectations of how perfect or how well you're going to perform. And also same for kids. Like what the researchers are saying is that this is not a year for kids to make a ton of academic progress. This is a year to keep kids from backsliding as much as possible. And I'm not saying that a year off from science classes, you know, is not going to cause backsliding. It probably will. I'm talking about in fundamental, fundamental um, skills, reading, writing, arithmetic, um, you know, being able to express yourself in language and numbers um, is, is top priority. Identifying as a learner and, and or a writer and or um, a math student, like identifying as someone who learns is something that you really wanna hold on to and let some other things slide, like missed assignments, you know, tech didn't work that day. They can still learn a ton if they can at least stay in that learner's mindset and continue working on their fundamentals. Even if they just maintain, that's a win. Because the prediction is that the majority of kids are sliding. So what you're really gripping for is not complete like making tons of progress it's actually making sure you have um you know you, you're trying to maintain where, where where you are or where you were at the beginning of all of this the other thing is really clear um schedules and routines and limits and i mean that's my expertise when it, when co people come into my world it's the first thing we work on especially routines and getting really clear about expectations because without that chaos <laughs> chaos and hurt feelings and stress i, I guarantee it especially in this situation, unless you just happen to win the, the kid lottery, the, the parent lottery or whatever, <laughs> that, you know, the personalities in the house are already managing all that on their own. But, um, and built into that has to be, and I agree with Carla, making time for yourself, especially if you're one who tends to put yourself last in the family. No one else then was probably gonna do it for you. I'm gonna say it again, no one else is probably gonna do it for you. So, got to do it for yourself. Um, and, oh, I was about to say that too, Carla, um, building academics into home activities. Yeah. Like it doesn't have to be like academics don't have to be separate from life. And as a Montessori educator, I mean, we make our academics reflect life as much as possible. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm real, this is really near and dear to my heart um, that like, like, and Carla's being more specific, I love it. Um, math in baking, science in independent research into any topic, awesome. English can be easily built in with daily journaling and drawing and, and I would say like telling stories to each other, right? Getting that sort of sequencing down and the descriptive language. Um, 
yeah, and she says, nope, no one else is going to do it for you. Yeah. Um, another one is building in some time outdoors away from screens because my gosh, we're on them way too much. And that's probably why a lot of you might even be going on a walk while you're listening to this or hopefully sitting outside at some point, <laughs> get a little sunshine, Carla says. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Um, back to routines and boundaries. One of the things that our kids are having to adapt to is that we're not endlessly available at all times. And to come up with really um, kind and clear ways for them to respect when we are not available and to, to recognize it for what it is and rec recognize what it's not. It's not, I don't, want, I don't care about you, I don't wanna spend time with you and rejection. It's not, you're not important to me. Um, it's also not, I don't, um, you know, uh, this, like, this is more important than you, right? Um, what it is, is there are, there are chunks of the day where we focus on different things. And for me to do work, I need to focus on, you know, my meetings, for example, or like this training, <laughs> for example. And to come to the, the clearer you are about routines and boundaries, the more you'll be able to establish this um, with your kid and with your child. And even in some ways create co-working situations where you settle them into an activity and you, you get really, really skillful at turning them away and getting them back engaged in their activity. And you have to understand when I was the only adult with 24 to 36 kids, or maybe there were two of us at times, guess what they wanted all the time, most of them, our attention, our full undivided attention. But guess what? They couldn't have it the way that, the, the way that they would in a one-on-one, -on -one, but we still needed to meet their needs. So we had to teach them so many ways to anchor into their own activities, get them going and set them up for success. So couple of quick ones before we wrap because we're just coming to time. Save some special activities that kids love to do on their own. The ones that you never, like it's actually hard to drag them out of, like whether it's like a new set of, um, you know, a, a new set of coloring papers, maybe if they're, if they're really into art, um, maybe it's, um, you know, a certain sector se section of their Lego collection, you know, that is really engaging for them. Like when you bring in those wheels and those windshields, they just, their imagination explodes with vehicles, right? For example, or certain characters. Um, it could be even like a special crafting project or something where they're like cutting and gluing something that they don't normally have access to or that they, they especially just get really engrossed in um, that that save them for those times when you actually really do need to be in your own, you know, space concentrating. And I would clue in the adults in your work situation or whatever it is where you need to have boundaries that you're trying something new, you've anchored your child into an activity and you hope it goes well, but please excuse me if I need to turn off my camera and step away for one to two minutes at a time during this next hour. And you just tell them what's happening and not make it wrong if you have to. Make it human, okay? <laughs> Let's all stay human <laughs> together and resilient. I hope that this round of Ask Me Anything was really helpful to all of you. If you what did you hear that you liked? Please let me know. I really like to hear what it is that might you're gonna try, something that stood out to you, something that maybe was just a reminder but useful. Put it in the chat, put it in the comments. Um, let's, let's hear from each other, let's support each other. Um, and I wish you all the best with this next stage of sort of coming maybe back into in person for some of us, um, you know, school situations. And do come back in March for the rest of the month on Mondays at two. We're gonna, we're gonna share with you and we're gonna even practice some in the moment coping tools because guess what? We need them too. <laughs> and perhaps we found a few that work, but why, why not expand to find a few more? Um, all of the coaches I work with, um, you know, in my program, I've got Dr. Leah, Dr. Luz, I've got Dr. Or, um, uh, Coach Imani, Coach Crystal, all these really incredible practitioners. And it's funny, we were talking about our coping tools and we, we all have some sort of version of like a mini meditation that we use. But then besides that, it's like, we're all over the place. Like one of them has to exercise. Otherwise she really doesn't manage her stress well. The other one needs to do like this deeper med meditation every single morning to really get that that feeling of calm. Another one has a has a lot of self talk. I also have a lot of self talk. Like I talk myself, um, you know, into a better place. Often, kind of coaching myself through it. Um, others, it's about moving their body in that moment. So it's we're going to discover that together this month, and we'll keep exploring. And also, um, 
you know, get some great ideas for designing our own calm down spaces in our house, which I know Carla's already working on. I know um, Sarah, we've, we've talked about it quite a bit. Um, and it's a, yeah, it'll be a fun project for the month to keep going on. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, Carla, nice one. So yeah, I mean, what a, what a gift to see in the injury you've had recently, Carla. She heard her back and she says, it's been a good lesson in communication because you, you can't just go put your hands on the kid or, you know, right? Like make them do something, right? You have to use words that are motivating or you have to be able to let, 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 let her know what you can and can't do and, and, um, and having to let certain things go, yeah. So at the end, let's choose our battles wisely and make them mighty in the sense that we lift up our skills, we lift each other up. Um, let's, you know, some shouting out, shouting out some love to all you big hearted parents for listening and being a part of this group. And um, we'll, be, we'll be back together next Monday at 2 p.m. And um, for those of you who are like, you know what, Vanessa, I know I'm meant to do more with you. I just feel it, I get it, I, I'm, I'm in for that. Um, let's talk. And the best way to do that would be to take this quiz, I'll put in the chat, that both, actually both Sarah and Carly have taken this before. Um, take this quiz and let me help you get clear on what you would be focusing on next. And then we can also explore if, it, if it's a good fit to work together with zero obligation. Um, and it's my gift to you if you qualify to have a strategy session with me where we get you even more clear um, by going over your quiz results together and getting you some, some next steps, okay? All right, lots of love to everybody. That's it for this week. See you next time for another, another, uh, another edition of um, Navigating Tough Emotions as a team where we're gonna work on those cool down coping strategies together. See you then.